All right, Joel Gostin here from joelgostin.com. Uh, this video to come is either going to be the easiest interview I've done for a while or the most difficult um, for, for the same reason, actually. Uh, my guest for this conversation has done so many things musically and is such a moving target. It'll be an easy chat. It could be difficult because that chat could end up being 12 hours. So we got to be careful moving forward. Um, but as I said, this guy's got a, a massive history, um, a lot of music under his belt, and most importantly, just a great guy. So I'm very, very happy to welcome from the great city of Chicago, my friend, Mike Reedy. How are you, man? How's it going, man? I'm doing good. Yeah, things are things are moving along, man. Can't complain. You know, we're breathing and we're we're somewhat upright, so there's no complaints, right? I, I'm with you on that. Yes. <laughs> Totally, Being totally. Vertical's better than horizontal, that's for sure. Any fucking day of the week, right? <laughs> <laughs> cool. So you, you've you got a lot of things uh, you've done. You have a lot of things you're doing now. So um, we may not be able to hit on everything, Dang. but we'll, we'll see how this goes. So um, as I said, you're based in Chicago, a uh, longtime musician in a variety of projects, um, let's start as far back as we can. Um, when and how did this all start for you as far as catching a music bug and wanting to devote and or ruin your life <laughs> <laughs> doing music? <laughs> it's funny. I was just talking to a musician friend of mine yesterday and we were joking around about like my spirituality and like religion and stuff. And I said, I think I found religion when my dad taught me how to put the needle on his copy of physical graffiti. And I think it was from there, like, I, I was really big into, like, classic rock, rock and roll, like, you know, 70s disco and all that. I just went off of what my parents played me, mainly. And, you know, somewhere around probably the time I heard Appetite for Destruction, I was all like, I want a guitar. I think I think all of us in that time period, like, growing up, were like, yeah, okay, I want to be Slash, you know. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it led to, you know, basically teaching myself how to play piano how to play guitar and then taking band class when i was in grade school starting in fourth grade and once i learned notation and all that i went to uh, right before high school and i kick myself now for not continuing going because like i think of what would i know now if i had gotten the rest of that schooling right but it was just enough to get me going you know so that was I think what started it and then I recorded my first song in high school <laughs> and I remember that I went to my my sister's friend's house because his da her dad had a jam session every week and they were like oh you want to come like come and hang out this and that well one day they were like do you play so a little and so I sat down and showed him a song I wrote next thing I knew about two days later I had a full recording because they all helped me out and it's like that when you get that first recording of something you wrote like like where you can hear like this idea that was in your head right that's suddenly on tape you're like wow you know this is what i want to do like i i, I want to do more of this and yeah it's kind of like how i ended up there <laughs> so stylistically what kind of what kind of genre were you playing in uh in those days because you mentioned GNR and all that. And that, I mean, we're kind of roughly the same age, I think. So yeah. our timelines are pretty even. Um, so was this kind of 90s rock? Or were you already kind of getting into that industrial vibe? Well, what's funny is, is I probably like when I was in a band called So Deal, don't ask, <laughs> when I was in high school. And we were kind of just like experimental. We just kind of went off of our rock and roll roots, ACDC, Black Sabbath, stuff like that. But we were also big Pink Floyd heads. So we just kind of experimented with sounds and stuff like that. And in the midst of that, I found ministry. And I, the first thing I ever heard was in case you didn't feel like showing up live. I mean, I'm sure I heard Jesus build my hot rod and NWO watching MTV and like, oh, that's fucking cool. But it was the first time hearing that album that when somebody said, this is live, I remembered after hearing Thieves, I was like, there's no way this is freaking live. <laughs> like a band cannot do this live. And that is where I started with the industrial roots thing. And they kind of dragged me in and it, I was playing a show 
the first show I ever got there, like real show, like where they told us like, you got stage and lights and uh, we got booked at the Riviera in Chicago. And it was one of those pay to play things, you know, sell so many tickets, I'm like, okay. And I remembered everybody in the band is freaking out like, oh, we're playing the rip. And I was like, what the hell's the rip? I'd never seen a show there. And I think I was 19 at the time, 18, 19. And uh, I remember walking at the, the first time we ever played there. I remember my buddy walking in with me and he stood on the edge of the stage and he was freaking out. And I was just like, what's up? And he says, dude, I saw Slayer here. It's like Kerry King was standing right here. I was standing right there. And again, it was like another one of those moments where I was like, wow. So the second time we played there, I had seen the copy of In Case You Didn't Feel Like Showing Up Live the night before. I had never seen the actual video. And when I found out that, you know, some of it or most of it was recorded at the rib, I was like, I've played on that stage. And then I saw Chris Conley scale the fence during So What and standing on top of there just berating an audience. And I said, that, that's what I want to do. That. <laughs> fucking awesome and i remember we went and played there the first thing me and my drummer did at the time is we looked at each other we played the first eight bars of stigmata we were like okay the the, the stage has been cleansed we can play now. <laughs> but that that was my introduction in industrial and i you know i'd like what's funny is is i liked nine inch nails but i liked pretty hate machine i didn't really care for broken or the downward spiral till later on and, you know, and I was Marilyn Manson freak. And then it was when I met my wife. Now we started dating when we were 19. And she said, well, have you ever heard the pig face version of suck? And I said, who the hell's pig face? And she's all like, well, it's this band. I said, well, who's in it? She said, well, who isn't in it? And she, she went to give me a copy of Gub and she gave me a copy of Washing Machine Mouth. Mm. And so I went home and I remember listening and I was like, well, it was cool. This didn't really get where it was going. She's like, what are you talking about? And then she's like, I gave you the wrong CD. She's like, here, here's Gub. And I remember I went back and listened to that. And I was like, that kind of led to Sister Machine Gun, uh, Skinny Puppy, uh, Thrill Kill Colt. Oh, God. And, you know, countless others through that stream. And it was the rabbit hole. You know, it was like, that's all I needed. And it was just like, well, wait a minute. You know, Revco and Ministry and nine inch nails and front two four two and like all these people are like this giant living thing that's what drew me into industrial music was i liked what i always viewed wax tracks to be was like this giant incestuous family <laughs> you know like you could find everybody in anybody's projects and i thought that was so cool and it's still like that today yeah the the Chicago experience is, and this is universal with everybody. It's a slight variation of this, but this is generally how it goes. Hey, good to meet you, man. 20 minutes later, hey, you're all right. Let's do a record. Yeah. <laughs> it's, that, it's that easy. Five minutes and you're in a band. That's how it yeah. works. You know? <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's a meme out there that says something like, you know, 30 bands in Chicago and it's the same four people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth, you know, but it's, and it's such an, the thing I liked about industrial also was, and I think like the journey along it even proved it to me, but like it always, like I said, I was a music nerd. I liked, I was in the theater, the whole nine yards. And it was like, when I found out that industrial was even, because to me, ministry, that was industrial, that machine-like sound. And I know, you know, that's where a lot of people say, well, that's what it is. But when you look down the, the barrel of industrial music, it's huge. And you realize that it was more of like this, like, I don't know. I don't want to say a cult. <laughs> it was more like this group of people that all found each other. And it was like, they just could coagulate it wasn't like one thing like you could find so many different things inside that genre and like i remember there was a night we were at a club and i remember laughing about because i'm like there's a guy in a business suit a guy in a gimp suit and a couple dressed up like they're from the gothic age of the 1800s and i'm like they're all here for the same band right that's awesome <laughs> you know and in our case they play in the same fucking band yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. which we'll get into in a bit but I want, I'm, and there's so many tentacles, you know, that where we can follow this. But I want to 
first of all, hit on worm because, you know, I think it's very safe to say that's your, that's your baby. That's your long running project. I think that's where most people in and out of Chicago would know you from. Yeah. Um, now, and worm has been around a while, right? Uh, is it like late nineties, <laughs> early two thousands that kicked off? Uh, in fact, I started it the, uh, the first day of 1999. That's when I decided, okay, this is, this is what I'm going to do. The, the band I was in in high school kind of disbanded. And uh, I, you know, I've been dating my soon to be wife one day. And we've been together like six months and we were sitting down in her base one day and she said, you know, you said you were a musician. I said, well, I am a musician. She said, I haven't seen you write anything the whole time we've been together. And that was the night where I was like, oh yeah, okay, I can do this. And I had already knew that I wanted to kind of go for that industrial sound. I wanted to kind of go for, you know, I, I got classic rock roots. I can't help it. Like, like I said, Sabbath and ACDC and all that, that's, that's like just rock and roll. Right. But I was like, if you distort the living hell out of it and, you know, throw some 808s in there, like you can definitely get that sound. And I, I remembered a, a buddy of mine hit him found a program for me let's just say it that way it fell off the back of a truck and he came over and he gave it to me and he was just like hey this is a, a tracking program because i had you know I, we were working with four tracks before and i was still trying to grasp the whole concept to it of how to how how to do this electronically and when he showed me this program i was like wait a minute this all makes sense now i can just plug my guitar in and record and you know back then it was like you had a gig in your hard drive it was just like i got so much space <laughs> and it's not like I think about that now and I'm all like I remember filling that thing up probably within two months yeah and it was like oh my god I need more <laughs> but yeah I, I remember starting it I started it then and I put the band together later that year and I believe it was by the following year we had started playing shows Excellent. but we just played around the Chicagoland area so really this is 25 years this year. Yeah, <laughs> I just think about that, and I'm all like, "Oh God, I've wasted most of my life." <laughs> but, but then, on the other hand, it's like you think of all the things you've done, and you've gone and and you've met so many people along the way. You know, like that. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to get too far ahead, but like, you know, I remember like by the time I was playing with Project Forty Four. It was all like meeting all those guys and going on the road. I realized that like I was on Team Project 44, but at the same time, if I had a group of people I was talking to, I, I could give them a CD, like, here you go. And, you know, we were in Cleveland and it was just like, you got to bring Worm here. Well, I'm still waiting to, but, you know, it was, it was nice to branch out that way and be able to help out somebody else while still being able to spread the word as you went along the way. Well, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's uh, that's one of the beautiful things about, you know, having, you know, I'll bring up the P word again. It's going to happen a lot, I think, in this conversation. You know, <laughs> the, the big face thing is like you've got dozens of people who each have, you know, their own individual thing. So yeah. it's like, hey, you, know, you, you you go to see Pig Face, but I mean, even before I joined the band, I'd go see the band. I'd yep. be like, who's that awesome singer? Oh, that's Cammy from Apocalypse Theater. Okay, oh, let me let me dig up that band, or that's Lacey from La uh, Nocturne. I'll go get her album. You know, mm -hmm. so, the, you know it, it's part of it. It's kind of never ending because everybody then goes off. You know, when they meet each other in that band, do their own shit. You know, so yep. it, it's, it's just endless. You know, it's like you build <laughs> an entire warehouse of records with everybody's shit and not have a duplicate anywhere. Yeah, exactly. And and even crazier, like you'd have multiple genres as you went along, and and mixtures of genres as you went too, you know. Yeah, totally. So if I have my chronology correct, you know, Worm sort of starting to develop and be a band, kind of coincided with the start of your relationship with Invisible Records and Martin. Yeah, right? almost kind of around that same time. What's funny is I remember that I wanted on wax tracks. That's what I wanted. I remember calling them at the time and they were like, you can send a demo, but we're closing in two weeks. And I was like, oh, so I had found pig Base at the same time. And what was funny was they were playing in Milwaukee at the rave. 
And I remember we got used to get these promo tickets if you signed up for the, the club and everything. Like ten dollar tickets, you get two drinks free. Big face at the rave with Chris Conley. And I was like, I've never seen Chris Conley live. I've never seen Pig Face. Let's go. And we were doing Worm at the time. And I remember me and my drummer Jeremiah went. And we when the screens came down and we saw the two drummers, we were like, dude, this is what because I had based Worm off of in case you didn't feel like trying to bluff. I I loved that idea of two drummers and chaos. And it was like, every time we go play, people would be like, oh, what do you guys like, the Doobie Brothers? I'm like, yes, totally like the Doobie Brothers. But um, it, it, it was like, this is what we're, we want to do. Like this just crazy party of like, hey, you've got so many people on stage. There's more people on stage than there is at the audience at times, you know? And um, so after that, I remember uh easy listening came out mm. and there was a cd release party in chicago and it was chris conley fashion bomb apocalypse theater and martin were going to be there and it was funny my my guitar player mike schubert uh him me my drummer jeremiah and my wife we all won tickets we're like let's go so mike's like you're gonna bring a demo right you're gonna give one to martin of course i'm bringing a demo to get the martin well, me being me, we got there. We're seeing the show. And there's Martin. And Schubert's like, go talk to him. I'm like, I'll go talk to him. In a go talk to him. I'm like, I'll talk to him in a minute. And then Mike just elbow checks me right into him. And he turns around, he looks at me, and I looked at him, and I'm like, hi. And he's like, hi. And I had the damn CD in my head. He goes, I take it you want to give that to me. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and it was from that moment on, I remembered <laughs> the, the other part of that story was, is I remember we walked away after we introduced ourselves and he came back and he was like, hey, can you write your contact information on this? I said, yeah, sure. And it's about probably a month later, we were like, well, hey, you could intern on an Invisible Records. Fuck it, let's give them a call and see if they need help. And we got down there right around the time the beginning of the United One tour was coming together. And we started helping out with the promos for that. And it I'll say this, the cool thing about interning at Invisible Records was, you know, Martin's Martin's cool as hell. He was just a sweet guy. And having the experience inside the office to see how you put together a tour. Like I was 23 at the time, 22. I had no clue. Like I, I'm a suburb kid. You know, so like when I came down to the city, like, you know, and it was all like, oh, wow, there's so much that goes into this, especially with something like Big Face, because you have people who are being flown in from other countries. You have to have lodging. You have to have you, you got to think about, you know, how you're going to get from point A to point B. You know, it's shit that when you're just in the band, you're like, yeah, we just, we'll just get in the van. We'll fucking go. And it sounds great. And so all of a sudden you start realizing, oh, there's all this shit that comes along with it, too. And. Uh, not only interning down there, but just getting to be in the environment was a huge learning experience. And Martin was so cool with everything, like, because that same demo I gave him, um, later after the United One tour, they had the Damage Manual show in Chicago. Hmm. And he was like, do you guys want to open? And I'm like, do we? Yeah, of course. We'd love to fuck it open. <laughs> you know, like we didn't care if it was a 15 minute set. We were like, we went over for the damage manual. I remember we were packaging double damage manual discs that night down in the studio. My old guitar player, Mike Mesplin, and me and Jeremiah, my drummer. And it was me and us and Martin's family. And we were all sitting there doing it in the studio, wrapping these things up. And then Martin's like, hold on, I'll be right back. And he disappears and we're doing our thing. And all of a sudden I hear one of my songs start playing. I'm like, what the hell? And I've been in that office for a year and a half. I've never played my shit. Like they were like, you can put anything you want on. Yeah, I'm not going to play my own music. And I remembered him coming up. He's like, yeah, I found this CD by this crap band. And it was the same damn CD I had given him that night. And I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. I was just like, you still have that. And, you know, it was from that like just being in that environment i learned so much being there and getting those opportunities to it made me realize like <laughs> like the way i always said it was is in the music business no one's going to let you right in the front door 
but you're going to have those friends who know that the back door is open or like, you can get in back here. And that was always how it felt like, you know, like here's an opportunity. If you want it, go for it. Right. I'm not going to hand it to you. Like you got to want it. You got to earn it. You know, and it was like, that's how it always kind of felt. And, but it was cool because it's learning experiences, you know? So I always wonder, like, I, I, Martin would always invite me to seminars and I always laugh because I'd be sitting there and I'd be like, yup, I know all this stuff because I was down here. I've seen it. I know. <laughs> but, you know, it's good information to have. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, the, you know, sort of worm, Martin, invisible connection carried on several years to um the point you and i first met yep lived in take phase 25 um at the house of blues in chicago 2016 worm opened that bill it was worm project 44 uh ruby was we right yep. um dead voices on air who were, yes. who were amazing that night <laughs> um, and then pig face so i mean that was kind of like the first congregation because i i hadn't done it for years until that night so it was kind of like reunion time and who are all these new crazy people backstage <laughs> we, we gotta know each other you know yeah uh, yeah but everybody made friends which is so natural to do in pig face you know yeah. um what memories i mean what really stands out for you from that particular weekend because that you know kind of kind of was an event that'll never happen again because you'll never have those 40 plus people on stage again for one thing yeah well you i'll tell you this one funny thing about that story is is while we were doing the the lineup i had at that point which was uh kevin mart karen reheimer mike schubert eric corner and myself when we were doing shows at the time there was a song called which of you like during worm i got this whole big crossover thing well, I used to have an actual stage 357 Magnum that I'd pull out on stage. Well, I'm like, we're at the House of Blues. I'm like, I think I better talk to somebody about that. Because we'd always just surprise club vendors. And I remember one guy said, I love that. He goes, one day you're going to get shot. <laughs> so I remembered asking the security because I was I had a hotel next door. And I said, hey, I've got a stage pop. I use it during this one song i said and it's a stage pistol i was all like what's your recommendation so the guy was like no absolutely not i was like i thought i'd ask he goes do you have it in the building i said no i left it in the hotel room across the street he came back five minutes later and he goes you know what i'm gonna go ask security for you and i'm like for real and he goes dude you didn't bring it into the building he goes i'm gonna give you that much and uh, the answer was still no but <laughs> uh but what stuck out from my, in my mind from that weekend, though, was the opportunity. Well, first off, the Thanksgiving night at right. Reggie's was awesome. Yeah. Um, I think that's the first night. I think you and I met that night and Roger Ebner and I, and I met him that night. And it, it was it, I like I had no clue at that point. I was talking to Roger. He said, you want to see my rig? And I said, you're what? And he shocks me up to the stage. And I'm like, you got pedals hooked up to your set. Where have you been? <laughs> like, that's what I'm looking for, dude. And uh, but yeah, that was that was cool. That night at Reggie's was awesome. And then the next day, you know, getting to open the show was one of those things where I was like, we can't fuck this up. <laughs> First, you know, like we gotta be good. And second off was just to stand in front of that audience and know, like, wow, in the next three hours from now, this place is gonna be just a. It's just gonna be people colliding inside the building. <laughs> It was it was a feeling. It was electric on stage. I'll say that much. Yeah, and you know, and then especially at the end of the night with you know everybody on stage playing like again, it's like you've been there, but then it was like that night there was this special thing too. Because uh, another thing was that was the first night I had met Martin King. Yeah, me and him had talked for months through messengers, like promoting for everything. Right, and it was like. I remember I was upstairs during Dead Voices on Air, I think it might have been. I was up in one of the opera boxes, and all of a sudden I hear Mike Reedy. And I turn around and I look, and all of a sudden I see him come out of the shadows. And he's just all like, How's it? He's nice to meet you. You know, and I shook his hand. And I remember he told me, He said, I loved your set. 
So oh, thank you. And he goes, no, he goes, the way it opened with the with the sample berating everyone, he goes, that was perfect. I was like, oh, you actually saw the whole thing. Like me and him chatted after that. And well, and that leads to a, another tentacle of things too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like you were saying earlier. But it like there were so many meetings that night of people where it was just all like <laughs> It, it it needed to happen. I'll say that much. Like it, it was nice to be. It was like a family affair. Absolutely. You know, you were talking uh, just now about having your shit together for that show. And here's the thing about being an opening band for a pig face show: you're playing for a lot of people, right? Mm -hmm. For a pig face audience. So yeah, the opening acts, if they're worth their salt, are gonna work to make this <laughs> great. And it's great to have opening bands do that because sure as shit, Pigface has no idea what it's doing. So <laughs> we have some bands that have an idea of what's going on leading up to that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, it was the weirdest thing for us that night because we had played the House of Blues a couple months before with uh, a different project we got. But I remember they were like, yeah, okay, you guys want to sound check real quick. And, you know, the curtains are closed. So we were like, Okay, and in my mind, I'm thinking, there's, you know, 4,000 people on the other side of it. What do you mean we're going to sound check? And I remember, you know, after our set, I was talking to my wife afterwards. And I said, so did you guys hear a sound check? And she's like, when were you sound checking? I said, like 30 seconds before the curtains open. So I didn't hear a damn thing. And it's what I realized, like, wow, the sound in that place is so well put together. Mm -hmm. And it's so baffled between the stage and the audience that you can get away with that. I thought that was cool. Speaking of the acoustics of that place, were you around early enough that day when Galen sound checked? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God, Mike. Oh, dude. I, I saw her the first time. It was right before Pickface 25 because Martin was doing a CD baby thing uh, somewhere like downtown and he invited us. And he was doing a panel and she was on the panel and she had played one of her songs that day. And I remembered, like, I was like, wow, this is because using a delay pedal and everything else to sample out what you're doing and then just keep going. I was like, this is she is she's so talented. And like when Martin said, I'm going to get her for pig face. I was all like, all right, man. I was like, that's going to be awesome. And uh, she was at Talia Hall, too. I believe. Was she? Yeah. Yeah. She had to. Have been. She's on yeah. the album. She's on the album. From that, that's so. right. That's right. That's that seems like a distant memory now too. I mean, that was what six years, five? No, that was five years ago. It was yeah. two thousand eighteen. Yeah, twenty. But still, it seems a lot earlier than that. But now it seems so far away too. Well, now we're all in like pandemic time, where nothing makes sense anymore. And... <laughs> time is irrelevant. <laughs> um, but twenty nineteen was the year, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that was your first official entry as a member of Pigface, right? Yep. And that was that was a cool feeling because I remembered, you know, I'd always just kind of been like, uh, when we were doing Pigface 25, what the funniest part about that was Martin called me and he said, hey, I'm having this art exhibit, which is all the artwork that has been all the backdrops and stuff like that. He's like, you should come down. I was like, all right, cool. We hadn't seen each other in a while. It was on Schubert's birthday. So I called Schubert. I'm like, dude, we got to go. And we went and it, it was awesome. I remember uh, Karen and Eric met us down there. And then Karen and Eric had to leave. So we said, bye. And me and Schubert walked back in. And Martin's talking. We had no clue what the hell he was talking about. And then he just looks right over at us. He goes, well, you guys will play with us too, right? And I was like, yeah, sure. And he's like, see, the worm guys are in. And I looked at the guy next to me and I said, what the hell did I just agree to? <laughs> and he goes, they're talking about a show at the House of Blues for the 25-year anniversary of Big Face. I was like, oh, that's what this is. And, uh, but yeah, we had always just kind of been there. And then that night, I remember Martin was like, you're going to make it, right? Said, yeah. And I got down there. That It was pouring rain that night. There's nowhere to park. I remember when I got to the building, uh, Roger and somebody met me at the back door and I remember he's like, here's your pass. And it's an artist. And I know it sounds dumb to anyone else, but to me, I was all like, wow. This was, this was Talia Hall, right? 2019? Yeah. Right, right. Yep. And it was like, that was like my moment of like, 
oh wow i'm like cool like and martin told me he's like oh you've always been there and i'm like but for me it felt like wow this was finally the okay you can say it now <laughs> great man that's great i missed you on that tour I, I only did the new york date on that run because november is always a crazy month for me and there's no way i could have done a cross-country <laughs> in november of 2019 um but we're on the record so right on. <laughs> that's all that matters right I, I was gonna say it was so weird too i'm not a drummer so like jumping up on a kit for a couple songs and knowing that i'm sitting there playing you know i get i got bill in front of me and then there's martin and then there's leanne and then freaking danny freaking carrie right i remember going to work the next week everyone's like so how was your weekend i said well, I got to play drums with, with the drummer from Duel. They were like, yeah, sure you did. No, seriously, really, here's Pitchy. <laughs> That's always fun to, you know, skirt between reality and then your 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 rock and roll life, you know, when you get to have those moments. <laughs> well, I, real quick story. Early 2020, right before lockdown, I sold my house, my old house. Mm-hmm. So I had like, you know, I was working with a realtor and we're, you know, I was like showing him, you know, or actually it was, a, it was a lady who came and I was showing around the house. And in the basement, I had um, a pig face poster from that tour with all the names and a drum set. So sure, the basement, like, yeah, there's the washing machine. She's like, oh, you're a drummer. That's so cool. What kind of music do you play? And I said, uh, you know, kind of heavier stuff. She goes, oh, you mean like Tool? And I'm like, well, it's funny you mentioned that. And I like, <laughs> <show the poster. laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely the way I've looked at it is, is it's like, again, it's another one of those families. It's another hub, you know, in the, in this giant massive nucleus, I guess, of what is industrial music, you know, like, I think it's, it's kind of cool too because there's so many different little hubs and different little nodes, you know, off of that of of bands that have just kept going for years, and it's like that's awesome. There's a legacy there. Well, on the topic of records we appear on together, um, that's not the only one because I had the honor of playing on a Worm record. A you had my the thing I love about that is my interpreter dance with you. Yes, yes. And <laughs> we, we, we gotta we gotta put the context together for that. Yes. So <laughs> this is the spring of spring sometime in, yeah, spring of 2019. Okay. I go out to Chicago um and have a weekend planned around the misfits doing a That's show right. out in Chicago with fear. Mm -hmm. So um you know I'm staying at Rogers. And you and I had been in touch, like, yeah, you know, when you're in town, come by, we'll record a track. Um, and I remember that day, I think that was the last night, maybe the day before I, I was leaving, like, the next morning or something. Maybe even that evening, I can't recall. But, yeah. you know, I was pretty fried at the end, like, literally and figuratively, to be honest, by the end of that, that run. You had every right to be, too. <laughs> yeah, so... And the way that all went down was I was playing to a click, which I'm not a big fan of anyway, but I'm playing to a click with all the other shit already recorded, you know, which um, kind of like Chinese water torture for me. Plus the fact that I, really, you know, I've been like up for however many days, you know, so it, it, I'll admit it, it wasn't going all that great, you know, the first <laughs> was really hurting so <laughs> that like kind of helped me get into a groove you start fucking dancing and <laughs> it worked well and what's what's funny about that is is the one thing i've always been told over all the years like anybody i work with they're always like watch mike and i always laughed and they're like dude you'll know where the cues are and it was like i realized that like i guess it was just because of watching frontman my whole life I always thought they were just looking cool. Yeah, probably most of the time they were just looking cool. But I think the other times it was like, you know, I, when we used to play more freeformed, I used to love it because we had songs where I could stop the band and hold them till we wanted to start again. And I, 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 it's interesting when you can actually get that click with somebody else. And it's like, I knew if I got in the room with you, I was like, minute me and me were in there, 
I was like, there's a click just, it sucks everything out of it. It does. So if you have the metrodome there just to keep you on time of where you're at, if you have a band playing, everybody I think kind of pulls more into it. You know, I think that's what helps. You know, you need that spirit in the room. Otherwise it is just soulless after all. <laughs> you know, like it's just like machine work. Do you remember what else happened that day when we were recording? Are you talking about the final note of the Yes. Of the... <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that you know what's funny is, is I think Eric still has the original tracks from that session because he sent me all the edited ones. And I remember you could hear the last note, thud. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> the very last note my kick drum my 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 pedal goes straight through the drum <laughs> we're done it, it was perfect though we had to take that's all that mattered yeah that was and you that you bring that up that was strange too because i was working on three eps at the time i had like 21 songs and i'm like i don't want to make a full length no nobody i don't know the, the more and more again a whole other weird conversation the more and more the music business goes along it tends to be after a while it seems people are more uh, 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 go going for eps four or five songs right it, it's all like you know trying to sell the, the days of selling an album or here nor there it, it just depends if, if you've got the base to be able to pull it yeah but most of the time people's attention is four or five songs that's something for them to sink their teeth into and um I remember the last time me and Eric were in the studio, I think it was like at the end of summer and we were planning on getting back together later on in the year and then COVID hit and it was weird and like everything shut down. And at that moment, it was kind of one of those things where it was like I, what we had been doing for years, suddenly more and more people started getting into, which was like, Hey, how about I send you these tracks? Can you work on them and send them back to me? Or you'll send me a track. I'll send you something back. And it may, it, it, I think it helped a lot of us get through that whole time period too. Yeah. Cause a lot of cool music came out of it from lots of different places. Oh my God. So many different places. And it was like, because people I think had that time to kind of work together right. and you know, it was like, it, it, it puts you more, I guess, in a perspective because trying to, trying to get six guys into a studio at the same time, like Roger always says, it's like hurting cats. <laughs> I, I have a project with Roger. We have 10 people in this room. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And who and who's hurting the cats? <laughs> I got that honor. It's been fun, man. I'll tell you. I always call it playing daddy because that's what it's like because they all look to you. Like, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, when we did the last two worm outings, I remember the first, if it wasn't for uh, Joyce and Jesse Hunt, it never would have happened because at the time I was just kind of like, dude, I was like, what's the point? Why? And they were like, no, we're, you're going to go do this show. And I was like, all right, fine. Let's see what happens. And it all kind of pulled together. And I was kind of shocked because it was this ragged tag muffin group of guys. We all threw together. I had Adrian Halo, uh, Jesse Hunt, uh, Michael Allen Rose, uh, Jill, Jill, Jen Gilbert, Eric, myself, and uh, Bill Byer on keyboards. And I remember the first rehearsal, I remember telling Eric, I said, dude, we don't have time. This isn't gonna work. And the first rehearsal, boom, everything snapped together. And we only had two more after that. And it was like, uh, me and Adrian were just talking about this. They were like six to eight hour rehearsals, but two hours of it was spent hanging out. Like, you know, you get hot as hell in the rehearsal space after the third time through the set. So it was just like, okay, let's go chill for a while. And like even Adrian was saying, he was like, that was cool because it gave us all a chance. We all knew who we were. We had just never been in the same room together. Mm. And so it was kind of cool to spend some time just hanging out and getting to know everybody. And the, the sets after that were even better because it's just like you kind of get some camaraderie going, you know, and it's I think I learned that from watching Pig Face, too. You'd see those rehearsals and everybody kind of wander in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden this magic is happening like four hours later. It's like, wow, that's cool. Um, it, it's the same thing. I, I've done acoustic stuff where um, I, I remember actually uh, Jamie Duffy, who they do cold waves over every year. I met Jamie through in, Invisible. I didn't know him as well as everybody else. But I just knew like anytime I walked into a club and I saw him there, I was like, oh, I know we're, we're going to sound like 
we better know our shit because he's going to make us sound awesome. And I remembered I did electronic worm on an open mic night. He said, why the hell are you here? <laughs> you don't belong here. And then the next time I came back, we did acoustic. And I remember he's like, same thing as last time. I said, no, we're doing acoustic. And he said, acoustic worm. I said, yeah, he goes, this I got to freaking see. And I remembered afterwards, he said, what are you, what are you doing here on an open mic? <laughs> that always made me feel good because the acoustic thing, what I like about it is, is it's that free form. There's no safety net. Mm -hmm. You, you have to literally just be on your toes and it's, there's nothing to hide from at that moment. You, you, the drummer can't throw something in because all you got is a guy on a hand drum. <laughs> you know, it's like there is take a take a drum solo for the next two minutes while I fix this. No, it's you just have to go. And I've always kind of liked that that element of danger and stuff. That's why, again, going back a little bit, playing to a click, it's like I there's reasons to do it. There's definitely reasons to do it. But when you get those opportunities where you can just free form it and have fun and actually play and let loose. That's always fun. I miss that sometimes. <laughs> so that, that EP um, that I did that track with you um, is the worm EP, the fallen. Um, I'll include a link to the band camp when I upload this video and, and uh, I'll, I'll run by you some other links that I'll, I'll put up there as well. Um, but that was recorded. We did that at Louis Vtex place, right? Yeah, it well, it, it, Louis, it used to be Louis's place, and then Eric took it over after Louis left. And yeah, that's that's actually where I met Louis too. <laughs> like another extremely awesome guy, like genuine down to earth, really cool. I remember the reason why I met him was his, we were having Project 44 rehearsal there. And I remember Chris told me, oh, you don't need to bring an amp. You know, Louis got one for you. So I just brought my guitar. And I was thinking, oh, my God, I'm, you know, Louis, I've never met Louis. And I walk in. He's like, do you got an amp? I'm like, no. What Chris said you had one. He was just like, which one do you want to use? He's like, this. I can't remember what the other one was. He goes, this this rig, and this is my ministry rig. And I was like, uh, this one, please. <laughs> I remember, I think by the fourth ministry riff, he came and smiled at me. He goes, okay, that's enough. <laughs> so you were doing Project 44 um, while doing work. That was... Yeah. Kind of I met uh, Chris and John. Was, okay, you want real incestuous, weird, bad-ass backwards shit here. The first time I saw Project 44, they were opening for... Oh, God, I want to say maybe it was violent voodoo and then the next time we were opening with them opening for bile and their drummer was leaving and my sister was babysitting for john and so they said well hey they went to jeremiah and said would you be interested in playing drums for us so maya went and played for them and i remember i saw him play with louis spitek and uh, levi that night and I remember like afterwards, I, this is hilarious. He's all like, how was it? I said, it was great. I was like, but it was like watching somebody make out with my girlfriend. I wanted to be up there with you. And then what's funny is, is Eric, who's in Worm with me now, was originally Project 44 with Chris. And he was leaving. I took his place. Mm. And I filled in for him. And it's funny because me and him really didn't actually meet, I think, until about two years later. And we, I was playing a show at the, I think it was the Free For All Tour. We were playing and I remember we met and he was just like, hey, he's like, I like, I like how you're doing. He goes, do you want to know how to play this? I was like, well, you fucking wrote it. Yeah. How the hell do you do it? Like he'd show me all these other ways. And it was like weird. He's like, why are you playing it like that? Well, I figured out this. He's like, that's awesome. Like, I thought that was cool. And here's the funny thing is all these years later, me and him ended up together. And I'm all like, what are the freaking odds of that happening? But, uh. But yeah, I, I was, I joined in with them in like 2005 and then I played on and off with Project 44 till about 2010, 2000, no, uh, about 2012, I think it was. So. Are you on um, the album? Was it? The, the oh, first? no, I'm, I'm not on either of the albums. I, the one that I think Chris just recently put out, I remembered starting some of that stuff with him back in my house uh, out in the suburbs. Uh, probably about 2010, 2009, somewhere in there. And I saw the demo works of it. I saw what he had started. And I didn't 
didn't see it until years later when he finally finished it. But yeah, I I wasn't in there anywhere. It was cool though, like getting to like I always told them playing for Project Forty Four was like getting to be part of ministry. Because I, I saw your interview with Levi and he's talking about the suits. Well, before the suits, we used to wear bandanas for a time period, right? And uh, I remember Charles was like, yeah, we got to get suits, man. We look like disgruntled business workers. And I had long black stringly hair at the time. And I remember we went to the thrift shop. We bought suits and we were back at my parents' house. And we were standing there looking in the mirror. And I remember Charles was like, uh, we, we look like Samuel Jackson and John Travolta from Pulp Fiction. I was all like, this is awesome. And after that, that's that's was the look. And he was right. There was a time period that was when I was with them, that there was a monster, dude. Like that band, like I, I'll I'll say that. Like we could put a foot up anyone's ass. It was awesome. <laughs> like I enjoyed my time with Project 44. I learned a lot of I learned a lot and had a lot of fun times. So I'll say that. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> um, just recently, like in the last few months, uh, you sang on, uh, you mentioned Martin King earlier, yeah. King Martin, um, the new Dog Tablet EP, Summertime. Yes. And that's actually you and Dirk Flanagan, another pig face uh, band member. And yep. I, I've told Martin this, I think it's one of the best things he's done under the Dog Tablet banner. Um, I mean, I, I can only imagine what it, what it was like for you to, to be on that record with Dirk, you know, doing that. What, for was, what was crazy was is Martin sent me the track because he was like, you know, you heard Summertime before. And I wasn't sure. I was like, is it the one I'm thinking of? I'm like, well, well send me the, what you got. And it was Martin sent me that. And I was all like, this sounds great, dude. And he goes, well, would you be interested in singing it? Cause I want something more of your style. And I was just like, dude, you sound awesome. Like, you know what me? You know, he's like, I don't know. Can you give it a go? I said, sure. And I did. And I sent it back to him and he was just like, he goes, this sounds great. I love it. And he goes, you know, originally I was trying to get dirt. He goes, I wish I could get both of you. And I don't know if it was between Roger and, and Martin, but suddenly all of a sudden, like uh, we had a group chat and Dirk shows up at it. And I remember Martin's like, dude, would you want to, would you want to jump on this with Reedy? And Dirk comes back, he goes, it sounds good with him on it. And he's like, I don't want to, I don't want to, I can't remember what he said. I don't want to step on his toes, I think is what he said. And I said, step away, go ahead. I was like, dude, I would love to hear what you, I was like, even if it's your tracks, I'd rather that. And then Roger was like, we got to get you both in the studio. And somehow, I think it was a Sunday morning at like nine o'clock. We ended up going down to the studio and going in there. And and Dirk is, you know, I always say this, I don't want to ruin anyone's street cred. Dirk's a sweetheart. He yeah. is awesome. And I remember me and him just kind of had like a quick five, 10 minute conversation. Like, okay, how do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? Do you want to do this? <clears throat> and then we just played off of each other. And like I told him, I said, dude, this is so crazy for me. Because I said, I remember seeing you on stage with Pig Face. And thinking, how fucking cool. And now I get somehow through weird coincidence i ended up in this room with you and we hung out the whole rest of the day i think i think we were done by like noon we all hung out to like four o'clock and he was playing us music we were playing him stuff like I, I i was working on the trade album at the time and we were doing it at the studio and he's like well play me a couple tracks and we listened through that and it was like again this trading of music and like um you know it, it's like the idea of supporting everybody and being there, you know, I think that's that's the lifeblood to all of this, you know, and that's what that collaboration was like. It was really as mag as Roger says, magical. <laughs> yeah, man, I I I love that record. One of my favorites of of last year for sure, for sure. Um, you. you you just mentioned trait, so I want to get into trait because I've seen that name around, you know, online. I know you're involved in it, but. I, I don't know that you know terribly much about it. So why don't you fill me in on what's going on with that? Well, it was weird. So okay, like like I said, for Worm, I've got so many different uh, lineups and iterations that have happened with it because it used to just be Worm, and then we turned it into the World Organization of the Righteous Movement, which was something I when I started writing music, I never wanted to paint myself in a corner. I always looked at being a musician as having a passport to kind of go anywhere. You know, you don't have to. And that was the reason why I also liked industrial music, because it was just like, 
you know, you've got Ministry of the Nation has the throw kill cult. Well, that's a huge birth for you to be able to fall into. And I kind of felt like with Worm, I painted myself into a corner because when we turned it into that idea, which is a whole other concept, it was like, well, now you got to write to this. And, you know, the, there was a time period where it was just all like the idea of like deadlines and getting things done and stuff like that. It just started kind of being this regimented thing. And at the same time, there was a lot of stuff in my life going on. And I started writing stuff that I knew wasn't for Worm. And it became more kind of therapeutic in a way. I know that might sound weird, but it was just like, instead of some people keep a journal, some people rant on social media. I think I kind of do that too, but uh, I started writing stuff and it was like, this has no place in this other world. What do I do with it? And it kind of became that for me to where it was just like, if I wanted to escape everything and just kind of, I don't care what it sounds like, whatever comes to me. And uh, that was cool because I planned on it being just myself. And then I was talking to my friend, Roland, who I worked on to create stuff with. He said, well, let me look at it. And I gave it to him and then he sent it back with like a whole bunch of string arrangements and synths in it and everything. And I thought, oh my God, this is amazing. And then my drummer at the time, Ken Pillar, I asked him, I said, hey, would you want to jump on this? He said, hell yeah. And Roland hated me because Kenny got us his tracks, I think, two days before we were going to go to mastering. <laughs> and so we had to work them all in. And then uh, my friend Medivan from Lockjaw and, and uh, Murder Love God in Milwaukee, he did a guitar solo for us because he was just like, we, me and him were talking one night and we were talking about writing music. And I told him what I was doing. He's like, I said, would you want to jump on this song? He's like, hell yeah. And it was nice because it was only a couple musicians kind of, that's the way I've always kind of worked also either between trade or worm is, is it's like get the foundation, get the blueprint and kind of like what we did when you came in for a walk away. It's all like, Hey man, if something you do changes the direction of everything or flips it up on its ass, hell yeah. Mm -hmm. If not, I want um, like with the trade stuff, I remember uh, Jen Gilbert came in to sing on uh, a song that I had Dan Milligan from the joy thieves play on. And me and her talked and she said, well, I went over the song, this and that, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. How do you feel about this? What if we did that? And I just sat there listening to her when she was done. I said, okay. I said, I said, I got one thing to tell you. And she goes, what's that? And I said, you go in that room and you go be changed over. And she just looked at me and I said, that's why I asked you to come and do it because I know you can. And I was just thought like, you know, if you're interested in it and you want to do it, you give me whatever comes out. Because I think that's when you get mm -hmm. the true passion out of a musician when we were doing the worm sessions for stuff uh when eric and mike would be recording guitars i remember me and karen were there all day long and like i was like let's go for a walk we walked around the building while they were recording and i remember telling mike mike was like why weren't you there i said i want to look over your shoulder dude i want you to be creative and do it i don't want you thinking well you wrote this this is the way you want now like if you got something different if you got something that's going to take it somewhere else that's the idea you know, that's what you want. And I, I have a feeling if you're there, it, it just kind of puts a stigma to it, you know? So it's, I just let people off the leash. Go do your thing. <laughs> I mean, and that's that's the best way to do it. You know, um, real quick aside, because I think you'll appreciate this. Um, and I'm a little bit away from like doing the official announcement, the official media blitz and all that. But I've got this project I've been doing for years with Roger mm -hmm. um, and various people whose names have been mentioned throughout this conversation um, <laughs> and i had the same rule for that thing you know we recorded uh the drum tracks featuring four drummers by the way um, <laughs> and I, I, we would just go down the list of people who said yes i'll do it i'll play on the song and i just said to them each it, it's your turn here's the baton i'm not telling you to do anything do what yeah. you think you want to do to this track. And we have two bass players, one of whom is uh, your former constituent, Karen Righeimer. <laughs> and the other bassist is Greta Brinkman, okay? So I sent I sent Greta the track. I sent Karen a track and said, just send me back what you, what you think you want to do on this. Karen sends me this real kind of like like this kind of like you know 
dirty, like industrial man, you know, <laughs> which it, it, and it's actually like the, the foundation of the track, basically. You know, I mean, she she was brilliant on it. Greta, hearing the same shit that Karen heard, sends me back this super clean, kind of mellow, almost dubby <laughs> kind of bass. Nice. And I'm like, that's wonderful because had I told either of them, you know, do this, I wouldn't have had that that sort yeah. of dichotomy. So and and they sound so good together, but you can't conceive that in in anyone's mind by saying play this, play that. That only comes from somebody going, oh, I know what to do with this. Exactly. Yeah. I totally appreciate where you're coming from. It sounds awesome to you know, have those people that you were involved in kind of go in that same direction. I, I, and it's, it's interesting because I think you get, I think you get more out of it in that, in that way, because it's like anytime uh, the other track I did, the other, so the two tracks I did for Martin. And I remember I, I kind of got a rule. Anytime somebody sends me something, they're asking, especially lyrics, the it, lyrics are the big one where it's just all like, okay, is this a blank check or are there parameters? You know, like, is there a concept you're going for? Is there something I should stay within the lanes with? Or can I just take this anywhere I want to go with it? And Martin's always, ah, oh, you know, to hell with it, whatever you want to do. And I like that because, like, when I did the first track for Dog Tablet, which was Dust Bowl, um, Roger did the sax on it. And what I liked was it was such a 180 from what I was doing at the time that it almost challenges you to try to, you know, to, to try something you've never done, you know, like how would I approach this if I would, you know, like I just spent four hours screaming worm lyrics, you know, and like now I've got this real mellow chill tune, where would I go with it? And I think what was funny was when I was doing the dog tablet thing, I, that's when I did my first joy theme song too at the same time. So it was like these two different worlds and and with joy thieves it was a lot that's another one it's like straight up industrial like real heavy metal and uh so it was like doing dog tablet on one hand and doing joy thieves on the other i was schizophrenic for like two weeks <laughs> <laughs> yeah um we're not going to get to all of it you know yeah. um, but i did want to mention some of the other acts you've been involved in either on on record or live um, so you mentioned Worm and Trait, uh, Motivicken. Mm -hmm. That's Eric's band. They asked me to come and play. They're awesome. Com Rogers with them too, and it's like it, it was like here's the song structure, just follow us. Okay, and it was getting to play guitar. Like I told Eric, the coolest thing about this, he's he's been you know one of my guys right up on stage next to me, helping me do my thing for these past ten years almost. It was really cool to be behind him and helping him. You know, I, I I thought that was a cool feeling. Excellent. And Flood Damage is another. Michael Allen Rose, like that's another one I, I did uh, on his last uh, album that came out, ZP. I did a song called Nightmares Are Real. And getting to play with him was fun, too. We went up to Minneapolis, saw our friends in Apoc uh, Apox Theater, did a little gig. And uh, he actually, him and Adrian sat in on an acoustic worm show that night. And it was hilarious because we never heard saying that. I was just like, this is a song, just follow me. And I remember Mercy saying, You guys didn't practice any of that? No. <laughs> but Michael, Michael's amazing. Good guy. Uh, another act is Machines with Human Skin. Adrian's band. Uh getting to work with him live too was fun again. Like I got to play synthesizers for that. So it was, you know, a, a world I haven't been in in a while. So it was really cool to kind of like get into that element of Again, like even when Project 44 and those bands I got to play with live, it was nice not being in the hot seat. Right. You're not the one in control. Like you're one of the you're one of the kids. You get to have fun. You know, all you got to do is know your shit and follow along and be able to row the ship. You know, and that's what it was like working with Adrian, too. It was just like a real fun time sitting down and just getting a wheel on some synthesizers. Nice. And you mentioned the Joy Thieves. That's uh, Dan Milligan. Uh, and his project. Uh, yeah. You worked with Levi in the Urban Soundtrack. You were part of that, right? Yeah, there's, I remember like, there's so many people that have been involved in that because by the time 
Charles came to stay with me. We played in Project 44. We came back from a tour and he ended up staying with me for about six, seven months. And that was really cool because I remember he was like, I'm working on this thing called the Urban Soundtrack. And it's like, you know, would you help me out? And there's a song by a band, I want to say it was called Bone Basket that he worked on. Uh, Jeff, oh God, I can't I remember his name, his last name now, but it was a song called Take Cover. And it's one of the most amazing tracks. I remember like I got to do a cover of it with Levi and it was like, oh, I so wished it would have been part of the Urban Soundtrack. It was, I loved it. It was one of those songs where I was like, oh God, I wish it was mine. It sounds so good, you know. That's the only other problem with work, working through so many bands is like you sit there and you you get material that you're like, this is so good, man. I wish I had wrote something like this. You know, like I, I'm honored to be able to work on it with you, you know. But yeah, the, Charles is, he's, he's my brother. Like I, I love that man to death. Like he's, uh, I would never have, like I talked about Martin earlier, working with Martin was definitely a huge part of my education. The other part that I would give a huge part to that was getting to work at the Soco Hall. Mm. And I remember Charles told me one time when we were working on some stuff, like he said, you know, you remind me of a little Marston. And I was like, I didn't know Mars's name at the time, but I was like, who are you with Buzz? And I was like, oh. And I didn't get what he meant until I met Buzz. And then I was all like, wow, the, just the craftsmanship and the work that he puts into everything he knows his stuff and it's like clockwork and once you get on the ship like you know thrill kill cult was fun it was probably the best damn time i've had in my entire career well you you were stage manager for thrill kill cult at one point yeah yep i got to the 2006 tour i went with them and i remember charles said do you want to be stage manager for thrill kill cult i said fuck yeah and i said what are the dates it was i think it was like December we were in he's like it's like February 3rd through the March 3rd or something like that and I was like oh fuck I had to get a hold of my I had two jobs <laughs> and I told them both like are you gonna be pissed at me if I leave for a month and they were both like why and I told them I said I'm going on tour with the band it's a national act this is tour in the whole country they said is this gonna help you out with your music yeah and both jobs were like you're good you can go for a month and I was like, any place, I, I probably would have been fucked if I worked anywhere else. But uh, uh, yeah, and I remember going with them and my there's so many stories I could tell about that. But my favorite story was, is I remembered I went, they taught me everything. Like I had one rehearsal with them and this is what you got to do. Because I was running shit backstage too. And I'm, we the next day we loaded in the bus, Dwight Yoakam's bus, and we took it all the way to Seattle. We did Seattle, we did Portland, we did Sacramento. I wanted to say, and that was San Francisco, and the next day was in LA. And Pat, the sound guy, said, Hey, the bosses want to see you on the back of the bus. And I thought, Oh, fuck, tomorrow is LA. I'm like, I'm getting sent home. And so I went to the back of the bus, and there was Frank and Buzz. And I'm like, Yeah, we just wanted to talk to you. I was like, Okay, what's going on? And they're like, Well, we called your replacement. And I was like, Okay. And they said, We told him to unpack his bags. We're keeping you. And I was like, What? And, and from that moment on, I realized, like they told me, they were like, well, we had to see, you know, if you knew your shit, if you knew what you were doing, you know, you were Charles's friend, we had to make sure. <laughs> and uh, yeah, from that moment on, it was, I learned like how fast you have to become a family when you're on a bus, you know, like you're, that's your home for the next 30 days, yeah. you know, and you become real close real quick. And when you got a good working team of people, it's just awesome. It's a great feeling. Like I've always said, why wouldn't you want to be in a band? You get to go someplace every night. You wake up in a new town someplace else, you know, and you get to do the whole party all over again. But you just got to do the work at the same time. Right. Right. You know, there's always the party. But like, that's what I would, Charles would always tell me is everybody wants to be at the party. Nobody wants to do the work to be there. And over 30 25 to 30 years of doing this he's right you know it's a, it's a hard lesson you learn a lot but you just keep going you know <laughs> who was who, who else was in throw cold then you know charles buzz frank uh, at that uh, time it was buzz frank charles uh justin who's still there and tracy was doing uh the uh backing vocals at the time hmm. it, 
fun group. Like, you know, like I said, it was awesome seeing how it all came together. And every night, you know, it was just all like, <laughs> like I said, they come out, they put a boot right up everyone's ass. Like oh, yeah. the opening, I remember the opening of that, that tour, every, every show was, uh, this is what the devil does. And I was like, this has become my theme song now for the whole month. <laughs> well, I, I, learned, I just oh, saw but, them on the last tour a couple months back. Um, yes. I mean, and I've seen them a bunch. You know, I've, I've been seeing them 20, 25 years, probably. Every time they get better. Yeah. But usually oh, the band gets tired after 30 years or 40, you know, 35 years. No, yeah. they get better every tour. And, and the, like, like I said, the thing I learned from Buzz, Buzz and Frank both was like, if you're going to put on a show, put on a show. Oh, yeah. And I think one of the coolest compliments I ever got was after I got back from that tour, I knew what I wanted to do with Warren. That was like a turning point for me where it was just like, I know how I have to do this now and how I want to put it together. And I remember we opened for Hate Department like seven or eight years later. And I remembered after the set, Siebel pulled me aside and he said, you know, you remind me of. I said, who? I hate it when people say, I'm like, oh God, here we go. You sound like Peter Gabriel. You know, like, but he was like, no, he goes, you guys remind me of a rock and roll throw up. And that was like this huge compliment. Like, you know, because that's what we were going for kind of at the time was just, you know, like have a party on stage. Yeah. You know, entertain you and you bought a ticket to the show. I guess I've always subscribed to Roger Waters. So yeah, I thought, yeah, might like well, go to the show, you know, like that whole idea. I, I could go up there and just jeans and a t-shirt and play for you too, you know, but why? I, I just charged you 10 bucks to walk in the door. <laughs> I better give you $20 worth, you know. Frankie better be sashaying on stage. If, you know, that's the rule, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, moving on a little bit here, some other names. Um, Crate with a K. Yeah, uh, that's my buddy Roland. Like, uh, I, it's a project. I can't remember who the other person is involved in it because Roland always contacts me. And like right now, I'm actually, I'm not saying this out loud. There might be one I'm working on. Um, that was another one when he sent me the track for that. I think it was Echoes of Sound was the name of the, the CD or the album. It was such something I'd never touched before. Something I'd never even tried. Like real kind of dubby and slow, drawn out long time signature. And it was it was interesting because again, it was a place I'd never been before. So like, how do you, where do you find your niche in this? You know, like, and being a vocalist like i never call myself a singer because like I, my dad used to say it sounds like somebody strangling a cat but uh being a vocalist it's like trying to find out okay how do you use your voice in this you know like where does it set where does it resonate and the crate stuff like the thing i, I love about that is the synthesizers on it it's so heavy sometimes this has got this like bowel shaking sound it's awesome very that was a fun cool. project. Um, what about Lockjaw? Uh, I, I mentioned Metavon earlier. He played on one of the trade songs. I met them through playing through Project 44. And actually, the first time I ever saw them, they were open for Marilyn Manson and uh, in Milwaukee. And um, I became friends with Metavon over the years. And I remember it was, he asked me to do some vocals on one of their songs. And I remixed some stuff from Murder, Love, God. That That's a lot of fun. Metavon is straight up guy really excellent musician and again another guy that i've talked to and it's just like we've got rock and roll roots you know like but somehow we ended up in this industrial world you know <laughs> hey all roads lead to that it seems right <laughs> one way or another you know i mean if danny carey found his way here i mean <laughs> exactly but, and galen for that matter i mean oh dude yeah oh my god industrial songstress galen lee <laughs> yeah. i mean it's it's one of those things where it's again such a cool and incestuous dirty little family yeah <laughs> absolutely um we'll see now i i may be mispronouncing his name so i apologize in advance is it safira v oh safira v um uh she's out of rochester i think 
I know she's out of New York. Uh, it's funny. I met her through Martin King. And uh, she asked me if I would do some vocals on a track. And I did a song called Necessary for her. And I remember after I sent it back to her, she said, oh, my God. She goes, no. it was supposed to be duets. And she's like, oh, no, I'm just going to let you have at it. She's all like, that sounds awesome. She's like, I got, I got the music. And it, much kind of like the Joy Thieves, I remembered, I was just like, okay, I'm just doing a track for somebody. And she's got some great music. Okay. And then later on, she told me the other two songs was Jim uh, Simonic from uh, 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 like Red Locust and uh, Electronic Survivors. And then the other song was Chris Conley. And I was all like, whoa. I was like, you know, and again, going all the way back to the beginning, Conley has been like a, a huge, you know, he's, he's one of those ones for me where it's just all like, I remember working with him with real Coke cold. And I, every time I went to the dressing room, I said, Mr. Conley, do you need this? Mr. Conley, do you need that? I've already felt like me. He goes, what's your name? I said, Mike, he goes, no, your full name. I said, Mike Reedy. And he goes, well, Mr. Reedy, no, I don't need this. And I just looked, I said, you don't call me Mr. Reedy. You call me Mike. You're Chris Conley. He goes, you can call me Chris. And, you know, I was, I another sweet guy, really awesome musician. And, you know, when I was like, I remember I saw him play and I said, well, we're on Sephira V and Joy Thieves. And I said, I guess we're part of, I'm in pig face with you. And I said, I promise I'm not stalking you. <laughs> but yeah, the Sephira V project was awesome. That was another one where it was just like, I'm with these two guys. I'm with Jim and, and Chris. That I was like, I don't belong here. And then the song was remixed by Matt from Caustic. Mm. And his remix of it, I was like, dude, I said, I've never really heard a a, a, a official remix of something I've done. I said, you made me sound awesome. I was just not like, I didn't even feel it was like me anymore because it sounded so good. So yeah, I mean, again, being able to walk in those circles and jump around from projects all over the place, I think is fun. It's, and another one on this was Some Bleed Better, which is new. To oh, uh, Michael. Michael was from a band in Chicago called I've Seen Kiss, him and Dorian. And uh, I remember when... <laughs> He had a Marilyn Manson tribute band too that we played with. I remember he did a, a project called Simply Better and he had two volumes to it. I can't remember. There was a, a few people on that. I want to say Daryl from Pound of Flesh, who was originally from Ministry or he played keys on Ministry. Uh, he was on one of the songs too. Like that was a fun project. That was so long ago. I, I think Sean Payne might have done a couple songs for him too at the time. But yeah, that was another fun project. After a while, they all kind of blur together, and I'm like, "Yeah, that's right, I did do that." <laughs> now, speaking of cover bands, um, you do a Nine Inch Nails cover band called "Now I'm Nothing." Yep. Um, how long has that been going? Now it's been it's been a few years, right? I started it in 2007 as a joke in the middle of a warm show. Mm -hmm. We were supposed to play for three hours, and I remembered I was like. Okay, I was like, we could do three hours, but who the hell's going to sit through three hours of our freaking music? And Trent Reznor at the time said, I'm not coming back to play in America until George Bush is in president. <laughs> or I think it was something along those lines. And I said, well, the hell with you. I'm going to play your fucking music then. So we were like, let's do a Nine Inch Nails set. And it was a joke. It was like, we were doing it for fun just to play some Nine Inch Nails and fill an hour. And then it was like, hey, wait a minute. That was actually kind of fun. Do you want to keep doing it? And yeah, so 17 years later, you know, it's, I was just talking to uh, Ian Steers from a, another Nine Inch Nails tribute band. He's got his own project, Stupid, he's out east, out your way. Uh, his is called Pretty Hate Machine. We were just talking yesterday. I said, we're part of this small little exclusive group of people crazy enough to go and try and cover Nine Inch Nails. Like, but it's fun. It's, it's cool to see the audiences because the audiences are so vast. You could have people who are teenagers and early 20s who are like, you know, they're, you can tell when you play the hand that feeds versus playing like last, the age gap. <laughs> but, you know, you might find somebody who's in their 50s, hell, even their 60s, who's all like, you know, dude, you guys are awesome. You know, you reminded me of when I was in college, or you reminded me, you know, and I, that's the only reason to do a tribute band, in my opinion. It's, it's to make people happy. Give them a night and have some fun. Well, I'm, I'm kind of curious. I, I've only done one gig in my life with a cover band. Um, I had a co-worker years ago um, whose husband was in 
a cover band and they were doing like you know it was an older crowd so they were covering like bob seger old time rock and roll and you know gotcha. carol crow and stuff like that and their drummer got stuck in connecticut and they were playing in jersey so i get a call can you can you come down to blah 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 in an hour i don't know any of these fucking songs but yeah i'll come down you know <laughs> so i i do the gig i got my way through it basically but what what what's stuck in my mind was the money i mean i i got paid you know with a capital p you know yeah. <laughs> so because you know, you've done you know you've done original bands you're, you're doing the cover band i mean you know how would you compare the experiences as far as you know the response it's, from clubs and the financial element of it it's funny you say that because like okay well, like now i'm nothing it wasn't until recently that you know uh i stocked a little bit of money into it and decided to do some lighting and stuff like that. And, you know, but for years we did it with just five, six guys and a box of cornstarch. That was it. You know, and we let the house take care of it. The differences I've seen between the original scene and like the, the tribute scene is, is what's interesting about the tribute scene is there's the competition isn't there. Like, you know, there's the dark side of things too. There isn't like the, the cutthroat kind of, you know, you know, slit your throat, walk over your dead corpse kind of mentality. It's more or less of like when you meet other tribute bands, it was just kind of like you'd have fun. And it was all like, you know, if you were on first, it, it was like, hey, we set them up. It's your turn to knock them down. And as you got to play with more and more tribute bands and put together more nights, you'd see more people start coming back. And so it became more of like a family kind of party type of thing where we're all just having, it's nice to see each other. You're having a good time. And like you said, you're getting bank. You're, you're making some money for the day. You're not making tons of money, but you can make something, you know, as we're on the original act, it's, it's a lot harder. You really have to push. It's not hard to call someplace and say, Hey, we got an national tribute. Okay. We'll book you. Right. You know, and it's, and on the other end, you really rely a lot on networking and knowing people. I mean, you rely on that with the tribute scene too, but it's, it really is two different worlds completely. And, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to be able to, you know, go out and have fun and make a little bit of money. And like we learned when we were doing the unconquerable for worm. most of us all were, I mean, Karen was part of now I'm nothing at that time. So was Eric. So was Mike. And I think Kevin jumped in at one point. The only person that wasn't traveling was this, with Warren was Mike Rose. So the rest of us all just banked our money after every Now I'm Nothing show. And then we used that money to fund the Worm tour. Hmm. And when we got back, we paid ourselves all out. Plus, if we made any profit, and then we split that. And it was, you could use one to fund the other one, which was... You know, I remember Chris Harris told me once, I'm like, why don't you just have worm open for now I'm nothing? I said, because I don't want to die. <laughs> like, but he was he was right in that aspect. You could you could do that too, and you get exposure for your band while you're doing this tribute thing too. You know? Right. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, the, the the cover band thing is interesting. And and like you said, you know, it it one hand kind of washes the other. Yeah. And, and the other the thing with the tribute thing is is it's like i've noticed too like you really got to kind of you have to you have to love what you're doing <laughs> like i i don't see anybody joining a tribute band or band they hate really because like you're trying to have fun and you're trying to just emulate what you remember and like i had, i had a guy who comes to oliver now i'm nothing shows recently tell me he's like the thing i love about you guys is because you do all the stuff that they do live and because we always try to throw in all the little breakdowns and stuff like that, even the mannerisms and like, you know, offhand. So we used to have uh, from somebody better, Michael, uh, Michael Christensen, we had him come out as Marilyn Manson one time we did the Starfuckers Beautiful People thing. Hmm. And I remember it was at the Cubby Bear, sold out. We were opening for Lateralis that night. It was a tool tribute band, amazing tool tribute band. And uh, I remember he was backstage. He goes, I'm so nervous. There's so many people up there. And I looked at him and said, kid, you're about to steal our show in 45 minutes. You're going to be fine. And yeah, when he walked out, the place lost their shit. And fucking when the beautiful people started, it was fucking over. We had two songs left after that. They didn't give a fuck about us anymore. They were like, that was cool. Meryl Manson was just you know, like, yeah. You know, and, but you give them an experience for the night. Uh, uh, you know, a show, you know. You're gonna do it. Go big or go home, right? 
yeah. that's what they always say. So absolutely. Well, we did it, man. We actually did cover everything. Hey. <laughs> Hopefully I didn't bore you to death. You're still sitting there, so that's a good thing. <laughs> oh, man, this is good. I, I, I love doing this channel, man. Yeah, you know, it gives me an opportunity to touch base with so many people, you know. And I loved them. watching the interviews too, man. They've been great. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's been fun. I got some interesting ones coming up. I'm not gonna say who they are, but um, <laughs> you know, people will just have to subscribe and do and do that. Subscribe and comment, isn't that what they say? Or subscribe and like, whatever the fuck. Down here, someplace, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Just watch the fucking videos and share them. That's all I want out of life right now. That's that's it. all you. That's all. That's all you're asking. Damn it. Yeah, exactly. Um, I know this is a million dollar question because there's so many things kind of floating in the air with you. But um, where are the best places people can go online to follow? You know what you're up to and and get some of the music. Uh, well, we got. I got trait up on Bandcamp, and I got uh, Worm or the World Organization of the Righteous Movement up on there too. And then we've got our uh, pages on Facebook too. So I mean, anything that we're doing, you'll probably find up on there more than likely. Okay. So, well, what I'll do is that um, at the very least, I'll do um, the Facebook and Bandcamp links for Trait and Worm. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And uh, thanks for doing this, man. It's good seeing you again. It was good seeing you, too, man. Just getting to chat and shoot the shit, too. Like, that's what it's all about. You know? I think the last time we did that in person was pre-pandemic, so. Yeah. I good mean, it's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be back out in Chicago again. It's on my it's on my plan list. You better, damn it. <laughs> yeah. Like Eric always says, it's it's the biggest, smallest little town in the world. Is Chicago, yeah. Um, like I have, I have more people to meet out there, so I can do more records with more people in Chicago. I mean, that's the that's the goal. Hey, well, you're a drummer, so that means you got to do at least six or seven while you're here. That's how it works, you know. That's yeah. how being a drummer works, right? You know, you know what the least impressive thing to say to a woman is in Chicago? Mm -hmm. I'm a drummer in pig face. <laughs> They're a dime a dozen, right? Yeah, yeah. You and twenty five other people, like on this yeah. block here. Which which one is you? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't quite work. Yeah, yeah. It works in New England. I'm sure. <laughs> it's not in Chicago. No, We've Chicago. I, I would be screwed, but <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of corner the market for New England pig face drummers up here, so I'm okay. <laughs> not in Chicago. You fuckers it's move up here. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> you're tripping over them out here that's how it works <laughs> yeah exactly. But, exactly well no thank you man it's been a pleasure having a chat yeah man let's let's not um wait as long as we did for the next one hey, and i got a new worm album in the works so maybe uh i have to give you a call i think <laughs> yes yes we get out I'll lock you and a Jesse in a room together. See what comes out in an hour or two. <laughs> you better stock up on kick drum heads. You know, you got it. <laughs> and Max Headroom masks. Remember that the last time? <laughs> yes. He also has Donald Duck masks there too. Ah, <laughs> uh, Jesse Hunt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like I said, another guy. Yeah. Those like. When we did that last worm outing, he was a driving force in that. I had, you know, I have a lot to thank him for too. He kind of kicked me in the ass and said, "You can do this thing. Just fucking let's go do it." So, yeah, yeah, awesome. I, I may end up getting Jesse on here one of these days. We'll see. <laughs> oh, he's all over the place too. So you know, yeah, can't 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 take a serious picture for his life, but he. Brilliant I don't guy. think we him have one serious picture together, either of them. <laughs> it's, I, have, I have several, and they're all just like of him, like mid spaz. <laughs> Every one of them. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like Jesse. <laughs> Love that guy. Well, listen, man, we'll have to do this again sometime. Yes, definitely. I, lo I, I was looking forward to this, and thank you, man. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, man. So I look forward to the next time.
Absolutely. Until then, my friend, all the best. Same to you.